the largest and least known group that people commonly work on. So the, the nematoda is actually a whole phylum. So probably nobody else here works on you know one group that's a whole phylum, other than my nematology colleagues, of course. So what I'm going to talk about is how nematodes make decisions about parasitizing particular hosts. How do, how do they choose one host over another one? And this has a lot to do with their behavior, their life history. There's also an overlay of environmental conditions that, that I won't actually get into today. And then the part about the, the slithering herd, the slithering part is pretty obvious. If you've ever seen a nematode move, the, the herd part I'll get to in a little while, and hopefully that will make sense by the, by the time we finish here. So in my lab, we work on a number of different taxonomic groups. We work on insects. We work on different kinds of nematodes. We work on plants. But there are some, some common, um, common threads to the kind of work that we do. So basically, we're interested in how animals and plants sometimes find, recognize, assess, and exploit different kinds of resources. So how, how do they do that? Those are the, the fundamental questions that we ask. And the model system that we use is entomopathogenic nematodes. Now, entomopathogenic means bringing, bringing disease to insects. So these are obligate parasites of insects. They naturally live in the soil or sometimes other cryptic habitats. Now, because of, of the interest in these nematodes as biological control agents of insect pests, they are commercialized. You can buy them at Ace Hardware if you really want to, so you can start up your own colonies and, and see how they work. But, but because of this interest, there are some parts of their biology that are really very well known because those were necessary to figure out to use them in the biological control. There are other parts of their biology, however, that are really poorly known. And those parts are some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So here's a, a picture of an insect that's been parasitized by <coughs> pathogenic nematodes. Now, the cool thing about working with parasites is that you get all kinds of really gross pictures, <coughs> especially right before a lunch. So, you know, I'll make a lot of references to spaghetti and stuff like that. But, but I guess we have pizza after, so I don't have any pictures that resemble that. So, so we're okay. So these nematodes are really a great model system to be able to ask fundamental questions about behavior and ecology. So they are beneficial organisms. They're marketed for biological control. Um, they, there are many data sets around that, that you can look at, they're very common worldwide. Essentially, everywhere anyone has ever looked for them, they've been able to find them, except on the continent of Antarctica. So if you take a soil probe and you went out into the lawn out here and took maybe um, 100 samples or so, we could probably isolate animal pathogenic nematodes from there. They're, they're extremely common. They are diverse in terms of behavior and host, host ranges and host affiliations, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. They're extremely easy to isolate from soil. Now, this is a good thing on one hand, but it's also presented us with some challenges that I'll, that I'll talk about. Another great thing about these, as far as being a model organism, is that they are really easy to grow in the laboratory. They readily infect Galeria melanella, which is the greater wax moth. They're a caterpillar about an inch long. and the great thing is that you can actually buy these from places that grow them for fishing bait. So you don't have to have an insect colony. You can just keep your nematode colony running through the, the galeria that, that you purchase. And they're pretty cheap. So yeah, it's, it's a great system for, from that point of view. Now, from the ecological point of view, natural populations of entomopathogenic nematodes have demonstrated impacts on host populations. So from the biological control side, of course, this is a good thing because you can reduce numbers of herbivores that are eating our crops. And from, the, from understanding the ecology of host parasite relationships, it's good to have a system where there is actually a, a reported and measurable impact of the parasite on a host. And I haven't been using that. 
Okay, and as Brian said, these are closely enough related to Cenorhabditis elegans. So, Cenorhabditis, by the way, that's a So they're close enough to those that all of the genetic tools and the biochemical tools and the behavioral tools that have been developed for Cenorhabditis, we can adapt to using in our system as well. So we can borrow a lot of, of already well-developed tools to ask questions about these nematodes. And this is, um, this is a picture of one of, oh, I'm going to pull Jim's computer outside to the floor. So this is a, a product called Nemesis, which is, you know, pretty cool. Um, there, there are other cornier names to this um, that I won't get into. But um, these are infective stage juvenile nematodes that are available for sale. And you can use them in your lawns. Um, or other things to get rid of pests, pest insects that live in the soil that are in your garden or eating your grass or whatever. So, and they're really great. I put it up there twice. Um, the taxonomic diversity is, is really great. Now, there's two genera, Steinernema and Heterorhabditis. And in the genus Steinernema, we have 66 described species. In heterodytus, we have 16 described species, um, but there are probably half again as many species that have not been described that are sitting in petri dishes on people's labs all over the world, and there are a couple of petri dishes in my own lab where we have undescribed species. So um, <clears throat> the difficulty is that there are just not that many people that are competent to describe new species of nematodes. <coughs> So I'm going to talk now about the, the life history of the parasites. It's a, it's a simple, direct parasitic life cycle. And just for, to uh, provide a little background about nematodes in general, so nematodes have six life stages. They have an egg, four juveniles, and the adult. Now many parasitic nematodes, including um, the one I'm going to talk about here, have a specialized third stage juvenile that is resistant to environmental extremes, and this is the transmission stage of this nematode. This is the only life stage of the nematode that lives outside the host. So the infective stage juvenile, as this is called, the Steinernema carpocapsi, is the one that leaves one host and goes and initiates the infection of another host. So this one, in uh, terms of size, is about half a millimeter long. So you can get an idea of, of how large they are. So again, this is the life stage that I'm going to be talking about. When we talk about infection behaviors and decision making, this is the life stage that does all of that stuff. So the nematodes are actually a pathogen pair. So they're associated with a symbiotic bacterium. And for styronema, it's in the genus Xenorhabdis. And these bacteria are actually carried in a specialized vesicle that you can see right here, and you can see the individual <coughs> bacterial cells. And if you, if you go back up, this, so this is the head, this is the tail. This vesicle would be right up there. So this is a specialized vesicle um, on, in the esophagus. So they carry these bacteria, and when they penetrate into an insect host through natural openings, usually through the mouth or through the anus and through the, uh, through the gut, they release these bacteria. Now the bacteria are what actually kill the insect, not the nematodes. So the, ba the bacteria are released from the nematode. They colonize the insect using insect tissues as a substrate, and then the nematodes develop by eating those bacteria as they develop inside the, the uh, insect. So it basically turns the insect into um, a small bacterial fermentation tank and the populations grow from there. And they mate. So the, uh, the large one here is the female. The male actually coils around the nematode, moves up and down, and this is the vulva right here, and that's what the male is looking for. And, and that's how they mate. And another cool parasite picture. So this is a scarab larva that has been infected by these enemopathogenic nematodes, and this is about six, seven days after infection. 
So if you take the infected insect and you peel off the cuticle, this is what you see. So basically, you see just tens of thousands of nematodes in here exploiting every little bit of that, of that, pair, of that host. So this is about six days later. Um, after about two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, the new batch of infected juveniles leave that host and they go out to search for another, for another one. So out of one single host, about an inch long, you get between 100,000 and 250,000 infective stage juveniles. Okay, so tremendous reproductive rate inside the host. So if you look at a generalized timeline, and this will, this will be important a little bit later, if you look here, these are days along this axis. So the infection begins, the bacteria are released from the infective stage juvenile within only a couple hours after they're inside the insect hemocele. So the first adults develop, or the first nematodes that invade develop into adults in a couple of days. They mate, lay eggs, the second generation begins. Now right about here, the, the, the timing of everything is all kind of mixed up. So they're not synchronous or anything in there because all along this time, you've got one nematode entering here, but you have nematodes joining the infection all the way out to here. New nematodes, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a confusing um, mix of, of activities that goes on. But again, this is generalized is the key word here. This is really generalized. So the second generation begins, third generation sometimes, you get emergence of new infected juveniles out of the end. So within a single host, you get two to three generations, depending on, on the size of the host and how much nutritive value there is. Now the nematodes begin to leave the host as the nutritional quality of that host begins to decline and waste products from the nematodes that are living within it begin to increase. Okay, this is very similar to, to dower formation and, and C. elegans, if you're, if you're familiar with that. Well, even if you're not familiar with it, it's still similar. So, um, now I'm going to talk about foraging behaviors and infection behaviors. And, and one of the first things that, that was studied about the, the behavior of these nematodes back in the early 90s was foraging behavior because of the significance foraging behaviors and foraging strategies have on how well these things will work as biological control agents. So as far as, as studying their foraging behavior, it's pretty interesting because unlike most animals that you'll ever study as far as foraging goes, these nematodes have no competing goals while they're foraging. The infective stage juvenile doesn't, it doesn't eat, it doesn't defecate, it doesn't develop, it doesn't mate, it doesn't do anything except look for a host. So you actually know what it's looking for, unlike when you're studying almost anything else. Um, and the decision to infect or not has a, a huge significant fitness consequence because if the nematode enters into a host and begins to develop, they can't leave that host. So you could argue that the decision to infect a particular host has as important a fitness consequence as any single decision that's made by an animal because it impacts its own reproduction and the reproduction of any progeny that it's going to have. So it's a hugely important um, decision. So how do they search for hosts? Well, you have a couple of strategies for foraging. And actually, it's a continuum of strategies. So on the one hand, you have nematodes that ambush. And they actually stand on their tails and lift about 95% of their body up into the air and wait for insects to walk by, to which they attach. And then they enter the insect through, through um, the spiracles, usually. Um, but obviously, they're associated with mobile hosts. They're found near the soil surface. Um, they were made fairly close to the application point, and they're not effective when you're trying to control underground insects, obviously, because the insect and the, and the parasite have to be in the same place at the same time. At the other end of that extreme are cruising nematodes that are extremely active. They move up and down through the, through the soil, looking for hosts. They respond very strongly to those <coughs> associated cues. So they're, they're a great deal of fundamental behavioral differences 
between nematodes that employ either one of these, these two behaviors. And, and one of the things that is, is pretty interesting is that this was important because of the economic import of the nematodes and using them. So if you look at Steinonema carpocapsi, this is the species that I showed you a little while ago. So this is how they forage. These are all individual nematodes standing on their tails here. And you can imagine when an insect walks through this sort of forest of nematodes, they all stick to the cuticle. And when they're on the cuticle, they are stimulated to search for carbon dioxide, which is coming out of the spiracles. They enter into the spiracles and then through those, um, break through the, the thin cuticle in the middle of in the tracheal system and out into the hemocele of the insect. And what's important though is if you have these nematodes and you're trying to control this insect, that's just not going to work very well because the nematodes and the insect aren't in the same place. And this was one of the first things, first reasons why anybody cared about their foraging behavior at all. Because if you take those nematodes and you squirt them right on that insect, they'll infect it and kill it, no problem at all. They took those nematodes, brought them out into the field, they tried to use them to control these insects, and they got no control. Why was that? Because they didn't understand the behavior well enough to be able to predict what those nematodes would do when they got into the, into the soil. Okay, so that's sort of the, the applied reason why we studied these things in the beginning. Um, but we began to ask more sophisticated questions about their behavior, about why they did things, and um, this led to some work looking at, you know, why, why do they infect particular insects and they don't infect other insects? So it has a lot to do with the, the um, species, the host range, um, the infection status of the insect that's already there, because now if you think about it, you've got a situation where you have a massive nematode, so you have, say, in an in a average infection, there might be tens to hundreds of individual nematodes that will enter one host. Well, only one of those nematodes makes a decision to enter the host as just the host. All of the ones that follow are actually assessing the, the dynamic properties of an ongoing active infection. So you've got the bacteria growing inside the host, you have the nematodes growing inside the host, so the quality of that host is dynamic and changing really pretty fast. So the nematodes make decisions based on, on this, not on just a normal healthy insect. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, but just to talk a little bit about how they choose, how they um, decide whether to, to infect particular species of hosts. So I said a little bit earlier that the nematodes are really easy to isolate from the soil, and they are. So the way you do that is that you, you go out and you collect soil, you bring it into your laboratory, and then you take a really susceptible insect host, like Galeria melanella, the one that we use to culture them in the lab, then you just drop a bunch of Galeria into the soil. If there are nematodes in there, they infect the insect. They have a, a really characteristic look, you know, symptomology when they're infected. And you bring them and then you isolate the nematodes from those infections. But here's the problem with that. We have no idea what they would normally infect. Out in the wild, right, Galeria melanella, they live in beehives. They don't have any association with soil. So it's, it's not a natural host. And if you isolate the nematodes in that way, you have no idea what they would have been, how they were making a living when they were already out there in the soil. You have no idea about that. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to figure out what the host range is. Um, also, as you could probably surmise from the pictures of the infected insects that I showed a little while ago, these are pretty fragile, and you don't find infected insects out in the field very often. I mean, I've been working on these things for a while, and probably half a dozen times I've actually found an infected insect out in the field, been able to identify it and say, okay, this nematode naturally infected that host. It just, it just doesn't happen very often. But we did um, design a host recognition um, assay based on, on behavior, and you can, you can predict some associations with hosts using this. Um, so first of all, 
we looked at behavioral responses to an array of hosts. So this is, um, well, different species of insects. So you have a, a caterpillar, a moth larva, or a um, tenebrio molitor, which is a, a beetle larva, crickets, galeria, um, corn earworm. Anyway, it's not important what the insects are. What's important is that the nematodes respond behaviorally very differently to different species of insect. Okay, so what does that really tell you? Well, it doesn't really tell you the whole story because what you have to do is show that they actually make good decisions. So the interesting <coughs> part of this was when we correlated infective juvenile production with the level of this recognition response, and we actually see that they reproduce better in the insects that they respond to most strongly. So this actually does work as kind of a two-step way to get at natural host associations because, the, and, it, and it shows that they actually do make good decisions. They do infect insects more red, or they respond more strongly to insects that support the highest levels of reproduction. So it sort of suggested that maybe their behavioral capabilities are a little more sophisticated than, than we were originally thinking. So we wanted to look at other, other aspects of their behavior as far as infection goes. And one of these is the stage of the infection. Now remember a few minutes ago I, I no mentioned that there were tens to hundreds of individual nematodes that would infect a single insect. Most of those nematodes infect an already infected insect. So once it's infected, you know, you have these questions. So how many nematodes are inside and how quickly are they depleting those nutritional values that, that the nematodes need? How old is the infection? All right, it could be up to two weeks. Is it conspecific or heterospecific? Is that the same species in there or is it a different species? Um, you know, does the infection status influence infective juvenile behavior? Certainly it does, but what criteria do the nematodes use to make those decisions? So we designed an assay, and this is, this is a really simple assay, that, and it only took about a year to figure out how to do it. So, we basically took centrifuge tubes, 15 mil conical centrifuge tubes. You put a little bit of sand down in the bottom, about two mils. You add nematodes, and in this case, we added 300 nematodes. You add your insect, and you leave it for a very variable amount of time. And then you pour water in here, and you collect the insect, and you figure out how many nematodes are left inside here. And then you can say, OK, how many actually affected the insect? So the object here was just to sort of get, um, get an idea of how fast do they actually go in there, you know, how, how quickly. So if you look at Styrema feltii, you can see that, now this is hours down here, and, you know, if you put in 300 nematodes, most of them are already in there after only a day. So they, they pile right in there really, really pretty fast. And if you look at another, um, in another nematode species, about the same thing. So you, you get this really quick response, which is not surprising because you're taking the nematodes and you're, you know, basically putting them right on the surface of the insect, so they can they can get in there really quickly. But this was actually designed to just get an idea of okay, if I if I leave an insect in there for this many hours, I'll know that there's about you know 50 nematodes in there, and then I can assess the other infected juveniles' responses to that insect and have an idea of the stage of the infection. So what we did after this was to take those insects and then pair them up to see if an infected insect was preferable to an uninfected insect. Well, why would that be? Well, an infected insect is actually a pretty good resource, right? They have to mate. So there's already potential mates inside there. Um, the insect's immune system has already been subdued by the bacteria, so there's, there's very little risk. So a healthy insect is not the best, well, we would hypothesize that a healthy insect is not the best resource. The best resource 
is an insect that has been just infected a little while ago, so you can get in there and you take advantage of all the good parts and you, you avoid all of the risks of, of infecting a, a, a healthy one. So when we looked at this, we found out that, sure enough, if you do the, the same sort of assay and you have two infected insects, each of those insects has, you know, 20, 25 nematodes out of 100. And if you have one infected insect and one uninfected insect, most of those nematodes go to the infected insect. So even when they're right next to each other in this tiny little tube, the insects are, or the nematodes are making the decision to infect the already infected <coughs> insect. And again, with Styrium glazeri, same thing. They infect the one that has already been infected. So why is it better? Well, as I said, at first all we wanted to do was figure out some sort of temporal pattern to the infection. But working with a, a colleague in the statistics department named Fu Xing, we were looking at these data a little more carefully. So if you look at the first, so if, if you take these data points right here, you can see that, you know, as, as we all dream up when we do behavioral experiments, you got really small error bars and everything looks really good. And that, that's what we really want, right? But if you look at those raw data, you get a really interesting story here. So if you look after two hours of exposure, four hours of exposure, six hours of exposure, look at the, at the variability here. Now, these are the, this is the level of variability among those individual tubes. So remember the experiment that I described. You put 300 nematodes in the sand, you put one insect in there, and then you take it out after these numbers of times. Now these are identical setups, but look at the level of variability that you have. So what we learned from this was that you know, Small error bars are nice, but they aren't everything, right? They're not always good. So when you just try to shrink those error bars up, the heterogeneity that you're trying to not look at because it messes up your statistics is sometimes where the really important stuff is and the really interesting thing. So, you know, you ask, why are there invasion rates of 0 and 42 nematodes at the same time point? So after four hours of exposure, some of those insects weren't infected at all, other ones had almost 50 nematodes in it. Why would you get that level of responsive, that level of, of difference? Um, why are some hosts not infected, not infected at all after four hours? And finally, is there a structure to the behavioral states of the nematodes that you put in there? I'll get to that in a minute. So the rest of the time I'll derive these formulas and no, not, not <laughs> So, yeah, it's not, not me doing the math, so I'll, I'll spare you all of that because I couldn't do it anyway. Um, but we did publish this in the Annals of Applied Statistics if anybody has a burning desire to go, to go figure these things out on your own. Um, but what this work did is, <laughs> even though I've been working with these things for almost 20 years, doing this one study, changed the whole way that I looked at how they infected hosts. You know, it was, it was a, a, you know, a big moment when you, when you work on something for a long time and you do one experiment and you think, wow, it's doing everything wrong. Not everything wrong, but you know what I mean. You know, it, it just changes the way you think about it. So one thing that we can apply to this is the idea of risk-sensitive foraging. So, when you, when you study risk-sensitive risk foraging, you have some foragers, some individuals in a population are risk-averse, some are risk-prone, but most individuals are risk-averse most of the time. And you only have a pretty small number of risk-prone foragers. Now what I'm arguing here is that the risk-prone foragers are the ones that are the first nematodes to go into that, to that insect. Okay, so finally we get to the herding part. The slithering part we've already been talking about. So the herding part actually comes from working with Fu Sheng and looking at those patterns and he looked at those and he said, you know, I've seen this pattern before but I can't really think about it. And then he came back and he said, it's herding. Well, what's, what's herding? Well, you got 
So here's herding of parasites, right? So you've got all of these nematodes, and they're all trying to make a decision about whether or not they, they're going to enter. So this is the stock exchange. These are other parasites. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the mathematical construct of herding is actually a finance-based idea. So the idea is that if a, if a stock is sitting on the stock market, nobody's buying it, it's not really worth very much. So it just sort of languishes until some is bought. So some shares are bought, the stock increases in value, more shares are bought, it increases in value a little bit more, and it goes on like that. So if you think about this in the terms of a host, okay, the host is healthy and happy, and it's sitting there, but the value to the parasites aren't really all that great. But then it's infected by a single nematode. The immune system's a little bit compromised, probably some mates in there, the value of it goes up a little bit. So it's sort of the same temporal construct. It takes actions by others to increase the value. So that's the idea where herding comes from. So if you've been listening to the TV and the, and the political stuff lately, you've heard about Keynesian economics. So this, this is John Maynard Keynes right here. And he described the stock market as like a beauty contest where judges pick who they think other judges will pick rather than who they think is the most beautiful. All right, so if you think about this in terms of how a parasite would think, all right, the parasites don't necessarily pick the best host. They pick the host that's already been picked by the other individuals because it's safer. So that's sort of the construct behind the idea of herding. And the parasites actually conform to this financial-based model really pretty, pretty well. But it, but it makes you think about things a little bit differently. So as I said, it's, it's a way to describe how risk is avoided. So what are the risks? Well, if they go in early, if nematodes go in early, the host has an intact immune system. It works really well against invaders. The bacteria are phagocytized. The nematodes are melanized and encapsulated. So they, you know, the insects have a pretty efficient immune system. Um, and if the parasite invades and it's alone, even if it's able to subdue the host and, and everything else, if there's not a member of the opposite sex there, it's still pretty much a failure in the long run. So the risk of a late invasion is that the host has been basically used up. The nutritional quality just isn't there anymore. So there's, there's sort of a sweet spot as far as timing goes as to when that host is of the optimal value. So we developed some hypotheses that, that we're still looking at here. So we basically thought that there would be two behavioral states for nematode-infected juveniles. You have risk-prone individuals and risk-averse ones, those who follow. So you've got leaders and followers. So a really important question is, what makes a leader a leader, and what makes a follower a follower? Um, also, the behavior of the group is dictated by only those few leaders. All right, if no infection is started, it doesn't really take off. It just just languishes, languishes, and the host quality has other aspects to it other than the infection status. Right, there are. You know, the other aspects of the health of the insect, there are a lot of other things to, to think about here. But, you know, using this sort of herding construct, we can look at these in a, in a systematic way and develop some good and testable hypotheses to better understand the behavior of the nematodes that, that we're looking at here. So, just to finish up, the, the next questions that we're really interested in are, you know, what, what makes an individual, individual parasite risk prone? Now, I suspect that it might be how close to death it is. So lifespan has a lot to do with it. The other question is, what makes one host better than another, even when you don't take into account the infection status? Now, one of the reasons why we started this is that 
If you do a, a simple experiment in the laboratory and you take a dozen insects that are the same age, same instar, same species, everything looks the same from the outside, and you put them in a container that's filled with soil, you apply nematodes to the top of that container, two-thirds of those insects will be infected, but a third of them won't be. How come? Why aren't they all infected? Why don't they all get infected at the same time? So it's not only the infection status, that's part of it, but there, are, there have to be other aspects of, of the insects that the nematodes can, can cue on. And that's sort of the other side of the coin that, that we're also investigating. So that's what I wanted to tell you. I have thanks here to the, the group here at, at UC Davis in my lab and funding and different collaborators. Um, Jim Campbell is a, an alum of UC Davis and he worked with Harry Kaya for his PhD and the three of us have actually worked on these problems for, for quite a long time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. So you you put two insects in a in a centrifuge to and after a few days you wash them out and then count the number of, of nematodes that are left in the two. Well no the so when there was one insect, we counted the numbers left in the tube. When there were two insects, we actually dissected <coughs> each of the insects and counted the nematodes that were in there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, are there uh, conceivable or even likely adaptations that individuals might have that make them better leaders beyond the behavioral tendency, like if they had more bacteria in their vesicle, could they be better at even breaking down host defenses, or just sort of, you know, at, yeah. or maybe even at one level, what's, what advantages are there to be first when others do follow you, and what other traits might you have that would make you particularly good at that? At that yeah, level? that's that, that's, a, that's a great question. So the, the part about the bacteria is especially interesting because Styrium glazeri, which is one of, the, one of the nematodes we work with, about 30% of those infected juveniles don't have any bacteria at all. So you know they, they sort of depend on the on the kindness of strangers to be able to subdue the host. So you know that's a real possibility. Whether the nematodes actually perceive that is is a little tough to get at. So yeah, there are you know we, we look at we look at it from the idea of avoiding risk and the idea that as you get old, you know, infect or die, and those are your choices. So infecting is, is better even if it's risky. But you know, on the other hand, as you say, there are there must be some advantages to being the first one in there. And if you're particularly adapted to that, um, we've actually uh, tried to do some selection experiments to get to that, to, you know, expose an insect for, for only a couple hours and then, you know, let the infection go through and so it was established by risk takers, so maybe that that characteristic would, would follow through, but we haven't really gotten to the point where we can see anything like that. But it, it's a possibility, yeah. Yes? How acute do you think uh, the nematode's ability to discern the level of infection is? Because couldn't the ones going in first just not realize or have an idea of how infected or uninfected it is if it's early stage? Could they just be sort of the accidental sacrifice? Right. <laughs> Well, um, there, there are other, other studies that we've done that I didn't talk about, and one of them that gets to your, to your question is actually looking at attraction behavior. So if we look at Steinema carpal capsi, infective juveniles, and you put them on an auger plate, and, and over on the other side, you have an infected host. Well, if the host is uninfected, you get a low level of attraction. If it's infected with Styronema carpal capsi, you get a very high level of attraction. So they can tell. But the interesting thing is if that insect is infected with Styronema glazeri, they're repelled from it. So, you know, their, their abilities are, are you know, way better than I thought they would be when I started doing this. Yes? So once they enter the host, are they committed to staying in that host? Like yeah. So they can't be like, oh, the nutrition is bad, I'm out of here. Well, 
Once they molt and release their bacteria and mold, which happens pretty fast within a few hours, yeah, they're committed to that. They can't, because that effective stage juvenile is the only one that can withstand conditions outside the host. So it's a it's a one it's a one way trip. Yeah. Does it suggest that they're responding to a signal from the nematode? The one that got in is sending out a signal for the other ones, or you you could you could make that argument now with. With the attraction experiment that I just explained, when we took um, the insects and just injected the bacteria without the nematodes, we didn't get that heightened response from the nematodes. So it suggests that there's something about the nematodes that, that caused this. We also looked at carbon dioxide production, you know, saying that, okay, if you have an infection, maybe you get a spike in CO2, and, that, and we know carbon dioxide is really attractive to the nematodes. And you do get a spike in carbon dioxide, but it's really short-lived. It's only, you know, maybe between 12 and 15 hours after the initial exposure to the nematode. So that really can't explain it either. Yeah. So I, I think it is something associated yeah, with the nematodes. Since they're different species, you tell each other that suggests that something yeah. is different from the nematodes. Yeah. Pheromones. Yeah. 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 It it could be there is a sex pheromone for for styrene. So. Other ones could be too. Jim? So wouldn't this be a general, isn't this a general uh, phenomenon? I mean, uh, and wouldn't there be a name for this? I mean, I know mosquitoes, uh, remember a study where uh, the, uh, the uh, guinea pig being currently fed on by mosquitoes attracts more mosquitoes than one not being fed on. Mm -hmm. And birds, uh, they're, they found a, 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 you know, a feeding site or something, you know, uh, other birds walk there and so forth. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something more general in the literature on this? Well, there's most of the stuff like what you're talking about, the, the behavior of ectoparasites are quite different from the behavior of, of these parasites because, you know, a mosquito can take a bad blood meal and then it can just go get another blood meal. So the commit, the level of commitment is not well, really the same. The but yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of examples of hosts that are infected being differentially attractive to other parasites of the same species and how parasites manipulate host behavior to make them you know more susceptible to infection and things like that so yeah there there are a lot of sort of I'm not going to say anecdotal but disparate unconnected accounts of things like that it's sort of a colonization thing right I mean well, yeah. What? Somebody settles there, and the other, other people can say that that's a pretty good place? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you could look at it from sort of island biogeography constructs as well. Yes? I just have a practical question. When you first try to start a colony of these things using your wax or whatever they are, and you've got a soil sample, what prevents you from just getting sort of a soup of 10 different kinds of nematodes in? Your, in your host. Okay. So often, often you do. So if, if you put the insect in there and it's, um, it's killed by something else, um, bacterial feeding nematodes will invade it because it, I mean, it's a great resource, right? But with the, um, the nematodes, the symbiotic bacteria actually have a lot of properties that maintain the integrity of that symbiotic relationship. So with um, <coughs> with Xenorhabdus bacteria that are associated with these nematodes, they actually produce nematicidal compounds that kill their non-symbiotic you know, part, nematodes that are not their symbiotic partners. So um, the, the bacteria makes it possible to be a really bad microbiologist and still maintain a colony pretty easily. <laughs> So uh, I was intrigued, of course, by the uh, positive, you know, preference performance correlation. They they do get more attractive to ones they do better on. And uh, I guess first you hinted at the end there that it isn't obvious what makes those hosts some hosts better than others. Uh, and an associated question I was interested in is whether or not you've tested some hosts that are exotic. Mm -hmm. and whether or not they actually somehow end up being good at evaluating even exotic hosts that haven't co-evolved with at all and can still yeah. actually seem to prefer ones they do well on. 
Um, well, the the insects that I used in that in that yeah. study probably half of those were exotic. Right. Yeah. Cool. I mean, because there were yeah. uh, cockroaches, which yeah. you know, out, out there they're they're not going to see many cockroaches. There were yeah, yeah. Um, you know, corn earworms, uh, house fly larvae. Mm -hmm. And then there were also cutworms and, and scarabs and things that they, that they would see commonly. And there didn't seem to be a, there was no relationship between the likelihood of them encountering that particular host in the wild and their performance on it. But not much is known about their host ranges, you know, because they're, they're so easy to, to find. I mean, we know they can all infect Galeria, but, you know, who cares? <laughs> Yeah. You yeah. about that last comment about how the zoogiatic bacteria are killing off the other nematodes. Well, first of all, like weren't some of these uh, nematodes or the symbionts, the, the, the genes that produce toxins that kill mm -hmm. the host, sequenced and tried to yep. reapply? Yeah, there are a lot of people working on um, pharmaceutical aspects of, of Xenoraptus bacteria. Is anybody looking at these nematocytes? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a, a project with um, Jeff Bloomquist, who's a toxicologist, recently moved to University of Florida. And he and I worked on this and, and showed that there was a, a, a stilby molecule that seemed to be responsible for the nematocidal part of this. What's, are the toxins, are any of these uh, Symbiont toxins used in genetically engineered plants now? No. Um, and there, there were people working on that for a while, and, and um, th there was something about the, the, it was difficult because of the size of the molecules of the toxins, but I don't really understand it that well. But um, they were not able to, to make that work very well. Yeah, the commercial product you showed initially, those are raised in, in vitro? And, and, and well, they, lose, they lose infectivity over time or, or not? Well, so commercial um, aspects of this, another advantage that these nematodes have is that you can grow them in vitro in a liquid fermentation tank. So you can grow them in a 100,000 liter fermenter and you get about 10,000 nematodes per cc of medium. So you can even grow loads of these things really easily. Um, so that makes the economies of scale make them more affordable. But as, as Mike said, sometimes if you go through too many generations, you know, they, they begin to lose virulence, which is a problem. So most companies actually keep stocks of these in on liquid nitrogen. So they'll, they'll use their stock for a while, and then they'll, they'll throw that out and they'll go back you to the... you lose the bacteria? Do they lose that? Or? They don't really lose the bacteria. Um, I, I don't really understand why, why they, they change. I mean, there's, you know, selection things that are going on. And you're, you know, you're selecting for something that grows well in a big steel tank instead of an insect. Um, but what actually changes is not that well understood. Okay, so we should start to wrap things up. Maybe one more, one more question. Okay. Uh, so what what uh, what counter strategies have insects come up with? Do some of them have immune responses that work well, or do they avoid yeah. areas in some way, detect and avoid? Yep. Yeah. Well, there, there's been a fair amount of work done with, with scarab larvae because you know they're in the soil all the time, and um, this there were studies done. Two of them that I'm thinking of. One was that. Um, scarabs, even though you know they look like they don't move very much, they actually move through the soil quite well. So um, a study was done where they had this this sort of mesocosm that was the size of a coffin kind of thing, and they put um, scarabs on one end and applied nematodes there, and then a couple days later, all the scarabs were done at the other end of them. So so there is an avoidance. There were also some work done on um, behavioral like grooming. That, that was actually pretty effective. So mm -hmm. scarabs are covered with bristles and they actually groom themselves and they can poke the nematode and kill them with bristles. And the experiment to show this was that they took 
um, scarabs and they, they wrapped them in little screen straight jackets so they couldn't move around in room. So the, the encased scarabs were actually had higher levels of infection than the ones that were free. So it sort of showed that that behavioral defenses worked well. And, and scarabs also have a pretty efficient immune system, but it depends on the, the nematode. So if you um, inject nematodes that would not normally infect scarabs, they are melanized and encapsulated really quickly. Uh, but there are other species that completely evade the immune system and aren't even recognized as non-self. Okay. <laughs> Behavior and ecology. So they are beneficial organisms. They're marketed for biological control. Um, they, there are many data sets around that, that you can look at. They're very common worldwide. Essentially, everywhere anyone has ever looked for them, they've been able to find them, except on the continent of Antarctica. So if you take a soil probe and you went out into the lawn out here and took maybe um, 100 samples or so, we could probably isolate animal pathogenic nematodes from there. They're, they're extremely common. They are diverse in terms of behavior and host, host ranges and host affiliations, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. They're extremely easy to isolate from soil. Now this is a good thing on one hand, but it's also presented us with some challenges that I'll, that I'll talk about. Another great thing about these as far as being a model organism is that they are really easy to grow in the laboratory. They readily infect Galeria melanella, which is the greater wax moth. They're a caterpillar about an inch long. And the great thing is that you can actually buy these from places that grow them for fishing bait. So you don't have to have an insect colony. You can just keep your nematode colony running through the, the galeria that, that you purchase, and they're pretty cheap. So yeah, it's, it's a great system for, from that point of view. Now, from the ecological point of view, natural populations of entomopathogenic nematodes have demonstrated impacts on host populations. So from the biological control side, of course, this is a good thing because you can reduce numbers of herbivores that are eating our crops. And from, the, from understanding the ecology of host parasite relationships, it's good to have a system where there is actually a, a reported and measurable impact of the parasite on host. So in my lab, we work on a number of different taxonomic groups. We work on insects. We work on different kinds of nematodes. We work on plants. But there are some, some common um, common threads to the kind of work that we do. So basically, we're interested in how animals and plants sometimes find, recognize, assess, and exploit different kinds of resources. So how, how do they do that? Those are the, the fundamental questions that we ask. And the model system that we use is Entomopathogenic nematodes. Now, entomopathogenic means bringing, bringing disease to insects. So these are obligate parasites of insects. They naturally live in the soil or sometimes other cryptic habitats. Now, because of, of the interest in these nematodes as biological control agents of insect pests, they are commercialized. You can buy them at Ace Hardware if you really want to, so you can start up your own colonies and, and see how they work. But, but because of this interest, there are some parts of their biology that are really very well known because those were necessary to figure out to use them in biological control. There are other parts of their biology, however, that are really poorly known. And those parts are some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So here's a a picture of an insect that's been parasitized by <coughs> pathogenic nematodes. Now, the cool thing about working with parasites is that you get all kinds of really gross pictures, <coughs> especially right before lunch. So, you know, I'll make a lot of references to spaghetti and stuff like that. And, but I guess we have pizza after, so I don't have any pictures that resemble that. So, so we're okay. So these nematodes are really a great model system to be able to ask fundamental questions about the largest and least known group that people commonly work on. So 
the, the nematoda is actually a whole phylum. So probably nobody else here works on you know one group that's a whole phylum, other than my nematology colleagues, of course. So what I'm going to talk about is how nematodes make decisions about parasitizing particular hosts. How do, how do they choose one host over another one? And this has a lot to do with their behavior, their life history. There's also an overlay of environmental conditions that, that I won't actually get into today. And then the part about the, the slithering herd, the slithering part is pretty obvious. If you've ever seen a nematode move, the, the herd part I'll get to in a little while, and hopefully that'll make sense by the, by the time we finish here. 